What's going on? This is Nick Mac Daddy Mac, and you are stepping into the war zone. Let's get ready to rumble. Step into the war zone. 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 Friday night war zone. Friday night war zone. Phil Flames, I'm with Mike on the mic and Joe Morley. About to bring you more heat. Welcome to the war zone. You can have a floor seat. Watch him on your iPhone. Watch him on your Galaxy. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the war zone. I'm Joe Morley. That's my co-host, Mike on the mic. And you guys might have just seen him. You guys already saw him at the beginning of the show. This is the man who brought Mike and I together. If you guys didn't know that, there's a little back history here. But Nick mac daddy you can find him on instagram tiktok at mac daddy ryan show or at mac daddy the ryan show find it find him but i'll let him introduce himself nick how you doing today i'm doing great fellas thank you for having me i can't wait to chop it up for the next 45 minutes or so oh yeah it's gonna be good and every time i get the chance to hate on new york sports as an la sports fan i just love to just Grab onto it and cherish it. It's a good moment. That's good. So, because I only like two New York teams. So, <laughs> well, we're going to talk about them. We're going to talk about those two New York teams. <laughs> Before we get into those two New York teams, hold your horses just a little bit. Guys, you guys already watch Welcome to Wars on. You guys watch Sports Force. You guys watch Friday Night Wars with Mike and I. Nick is joining the Wars on Sports Network. He is part of it. He will be doing the basketball coverage. Uh, you want to give them a little bit about your the new show that's coming up? Yeah, absolutely, man. I am so excited because this show is called Into the Crosshairs with Nick Mack on the Warzone Sports Network. And what I'm going to be doing is taking aim at all the trending topics in the NBA. Nobody is safe. Nobody is outside the scope, so to speak. I'm taking aim at everybody. That's trending topics. That's trending uh, opinions that I don't agree with. That is going in on some things, but also giving credit where credit is due. But mostly, you know, uh, you're going to get my very strong opinionated takes as well. And I can't wait, especially with the playoff push we got coming in the NBA and the NBA playoffs themselves. We got a lot of excited basketball to talk about. I can't wait to bring my passion to the Warzone Sports Network. That NBA heat's coming. Oh, yeah. And like you said, nobody's safe. And I don't think people know. I don't think people realize the rants that you'll go on, like how much <laughs> you're passionate about it and how much you put thought into it and that you're just going to go off on these guys because they have it coming. Uh, yeah, man. And also I don't like to see great players disrespected. I think there's a trend lately with the younger generations. Um, and I'm talking younger than Mike. I'm talking kids still in high school, middle school, things like that who don't want to, Give respect and credit where it is due. The guys that paved the way. When I hear that Steph, you know, I heard somebody compare Magic Johnson to Ben Simmons the other day. And it just made me want to absolutely lose my mind. Magic Johnson, a five-time NBA champion, three-time finals MVP. All because I said Magic Johnson's the greatest point guard ever and not Steph Curry. And you'll have people just absolutely go on tangents with no thought behind their arguments. So I'm here to change that. I'm here to pay homage, and I'm here to take aim. I love it. I love it. Mike's not loving it because he still thinks LeBron is better than Michael Jordan. I'll and, start this. Uh, this isn't the time and place for this. Oh my Into God. the crosshairs is the time and place for this. Into yes. the crosshairs, coming up. Yes. First episode. You'll have Nick a Mike destroys Mike in a Jordan <laughs> versus LeBron debate. <laughs> listen, listen, I've I've already dressed the goat debate, and I you know it's kind of like a tiring argument after a while because it seems that's all anybody wants to talk about. Mm -hmm. And I get it; it's a very polarizing topic. It's a very opinionated, pet, impassioned topic. And I've already admitted my bias. Listen, I fell asleep every single night to Michael Jordan "Come Fly with Me" on VHS. We're talking going back. You know what I mean? So I have a love and and like just a different level of respect for Michael Jordan than I'll ever have for any other basketball player. So that's already admitting bias right there because it just no other player would mean that much to me, you know? Yeah, and, and unless someone wins 10 championships and can be like 
Tom Brady of the NBA and just win every single year, we'll never get to a point where that argument is settled forever. Pretty much. And you know what? I always say this. LeBron does have room to overtake him. It is possible. I'm never going to sit here. And that's another thing that people do with the GOAT debate that I will be addressing on Into the Crosshairs every Monday on the Warzone Sports Network. <laughs> is, you know, there seems to be this popular to- like trend to disrespect one in order to give credit to the other. And that's just not how I'm going to do things, period. Like, you know, calling somebody the second greatest of all time should not be this insane insult, no yeah. matter who it is. I agree with you. That's good. I'll I be like number it. two. I Mike's like number two on our shows every, yeah. every time, so he takes no. it. Yeah, I'm why, cool. why you know how many people in the world would kill to be the second greatest basketball player of all time? Yeah, <laughs> or the second greatest host of Friday Night Wars. It's like the same. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nick, you got that. You got that gro- goatee going. I like it. I like a. I like you know, I'm- I've had to. I've had to. Like my, like ever since I've been able to grow facial hair, I've I've been called, been told that I have Viking blood. Well, you're wondering uh, why I asked you about that. I know Mike's like, why is he talking about goatees? I mean, we don't know. Because Nick's favorite team is the New York Yankees, and when you go to the New York Yankees, you can't have facial hair. You got to shave it all off. So uh, grab the razor. Let's go. Go get that. They'll take it off. But no, seriously, uh, Mac, what's going on with the New York Yankees this season? Well, you know, it's it's early. It's there's they started out slow, four and five. Obviously, the opening series, they dropped two out of three to the Jays. And then they come back and they take two out of three from Baltimore, but then they absolutely get smoked in Tampa this past weekend and drop two to three to them. And the biggest problem is our starting pitching. And I said it going into the season. Behind Garrett Cole, what are we really hinging our hopes on? Jordan Montgomery, Jamison Tyon, an old and washed up coming off surgery, Corey Kluber, uh, Domingo Herman, who hasn't pitched in over a year, Luis Severino, who hasn't pitched in a year and a half and won't be back till June of this year. Listen, I mean, I know we have issues with our lineup right now and not getting the timely hits, but I expect that early in this season. They need to find their rhythms. But the pitching has just been atrocious. They're, they're not keeping these guys in games. Um, and, and I've said it before this season that I'm not so sure that the Yankees are going to win the AL East this year strictly because their starting pitching is very, 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 like, just overrated at this point. It's still early. Let's, let's, we're nine games into a season. It's still early. They're playing. It's not the 60-game season that we saw last year, so – it is going to be the marathon season, so it's still it's still a little bit early. I mean, you are you have to be worried as a Yankee fan of what's going on with the pitching, like you said. I I don't know. Uh, part of me is like thinking, hey, is Aaron Boone a little bit over his head? As you know, like as the years go on, is is he getting better? Is he getting worse as a manager? I mean, dude, I'll, Aaron Boone catches a lot of flack. He catches a lot of flack, but let's be real here: the man has won. Every year since he's been there, you know, for his, he won over 100 games his first two seasons. Obviously, he didn't have the opportunity to do that last year. Um, and clearly, they, you know, they grabbed a wild card spot. They didn't win the division. Tampa did. Um, but I think given all the circumstances he's had to face, I think he's doing a pretty damn good job, to be honest. And I think a lot of what's been going on, I've been saying it for years. I think Cashman's getting it's getting to the point where Brian Cashman needs to hand over the reins to somebody else. Ooh. And I love Brian. Listen, listen, Brian Cashman has done a lot for the Yankees. He's been there forever, but I think his, his, his tactics and his motives and all that are becoming a little outdated. Hey, it could be. I mean, he's been there for a long time. Like you said, give him the credit where it's due, but yeah, sometimes the game and the analytics and everything that can pass you by and, you know what? You go on rant sometimes. I want to go on a little bit of rant. And and my thing has to be with Aaron Boone. Does what is wrong with Aaron Boone and the Yankees? And why do they hate Clint Frazier so damn much? Clint <laughs> Frazier needs to be in that lineup every day. I understand he had a bad week, but come on. Now he hasn't been in the game that what the, the last two lineups he hasn't been in. And they've done it the last couple of years where they keep sitting them up and down. Clint Frazier is the guy that needs to be starting. Brett Gardner is done. Like we don't, I don't want to see no more Gardner. 
Uh, I feel the same way. And I've felt the same way about Brett Gardner for a very long time. Mike, I don't know if you feel, you know, if you have any feelings for Brett Gardner, but I just think he's a very, he's also a very overrated outfielder. And this is coming from a diehard Yankee fan. (laughs) Brett Gardner's done a lot for the Yankees, but I'm just, for the last few years, he looks at more pitches than he swings. He, you know, he tries to work the count and I get it, dude, but you got to get on pace. (laughs) He's just not same. He's not the same as that big name that he holds. You know, and I, and I don't really quite understand why he holds a big name anymore. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It's just sentimental at this point yeah, is what I mean. Like, yeah, it's, it's more of like a past thing. I mean, so, I understand well, he grinds a little bit, but Clint Frazier, I don't, I don't understand. Clint Frazier would be a starter on any other team. Uh, they, <laughs> they, he should have been the starter this season, but they keep playing with him, moving him up and down. But that's just my little – one thing that every year I always I said that last year, the year before, Clint Frazier needs to be there. Uh, I agree. They need to insert him more into that lineup and get him in a little bit more of a of a routine with, with in that starting lineup. Um, he did a pretty good job filling in for Aaron Judge. I think the thing that's held Clint Frazier back has been his very poor defense in the outfield. Maybe get him in there at DH, but have you ever seen this man take a take a path to the baseball on a fly ball? Is it off? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it looks like Mr. Magoo. He looks like just freaking going every which way. I'm but, sure if they did a, one of those little stat tracks of his path <laughs> to the ball, it would just zig and zag. It's not easy to catch a fly ball. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Listen, easy. I'm not saying I can do it, but if you're, you know, the starting left or right fielder for the New York Yankees, <laughs> it should be a little easier for you. Yeah, I if you don't like him, ship him out. If you don't I'll like him, him, ship him out. I learned that lesson the hard way when I was like a freshman in high school. I always played cornerback and free safety in football. And my dad was like, hey, we need a substitute to come play in our co-ed softball game. And it's like no big deal. And I was like, what position am I going to play? He's like, well, you're a free safety. So just play center field. It's just like going and defending receivers and swatting down balls. It was not the same as chasing receivers (laughs) and swatting down balls. I'll tell you that right now. It was not the same. No. no. I relate with those guys. Look at that's tough. That thing goes straight up in the air, and you don't know where it's coming down. You got to have some kind of skill. Yeah, but Clint is hey, not the only Yankee struggling on defense. I got to say that because Gleyber Torres has had a miserable start to this season. I think he has three or four errors already in the first week and a half. It's crazy. I have, I have another question for you. Um, well, one, can Judge and Stanton stay healthy the whole season? No. All right, I answered that one for myself. And yeah. two, good, good call. Can Judge – I mean, are they going to extend Judge? Can, are they going to sign Judge to an, a contract extension? Do you want him to stay? What's going on with Aaron Judge, and uh, should they keep him in New York? Well, I think I think the Yankees will earn some kind of hometown discount with Aaron Judge a little bit. But I also think he's going to go after the big money, obviously. He sees what Mookie gets. He sees what Ballinger gets and these other guys, what they get. But they've earned it. They've stayed on the field. Um, I think in the last four seasons, Aaron Judge has p- played 63% of games. And that's not great. That's not great at all. It's terrible. You should be averaging at least 80 to 85, right? Um, with regular rest and minor injuries that you'd expect. But this man's oblique has been bothering him for two and a half seasons. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to want him to stay. And this is where I say it. He's making $10 million this year. Um, so, you know, he's coming at a bargain. There's not any player that you can find making $10 million that makes the impact Aaron judge can have in a, in a lineup. Mm. Um, and we have to forget that Aaron judge is, judge is a damn good outfielder too. Mm. He's got one of the strongest arms in the league. Um, he does not take Mr. Magoo routes to the ball and, uh, he's big, he's fast and he lays out and he gives his all. And I think a lot of his injuries, you know, they may seem like they happen on a big swing, but really they're, they're, it's from his heart on defense. That man lays out and gives it his all. Um, so do I want him to stay, though? I, you know, I have a special spot in my heart for Aaron Judge. I watched him win the home run derby in Miami, so I think I'm always going to love Aaron Judge. Oh, you got that emotional attachment. Yeah, they, they need those two guys healthy, and they need to figure out what's going on with the pitching rotation because in the league right now, there's just too many dangerous lineups to make it through the playoffs when you're struggling, man. This, the, I think that baseball is entering an era that's going to be very exciting with some of these guys that are coming up in the MLB right now. Fully agree. 
fully agree. Just within their own division, I think mm-hmm. the Red Sox have a sneaky good lineup this year. Yeah, they're six and three today. I mean, JD Martinez just came off the COVID list today and he goes four for five with three dingers. What a start. <laughs> That's JD Martinez. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, and like and like 440 feet the other way. Just hop over. Hey Nick, I know you're I know Yankee fans like to throw this out there. So I'm a Dodger fan. Mike's a Dodger fan. When's the last time you got to see a, a Yankee shirt like this that said uh, world champions? <clears throat> uh it's been it's been 20 years. Um no, not 20 years. What am I saying? It's been 12 years now. <clears throat> I think you're 2009. Nick, I got to give you some respect because I was just ready for it. The Mickey Mouse comment. I was ready for it. I was just like, I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm like, don't no, do you know what, dude? No, no. I Because I think, <laughs> honestly, I can't say that. <laughs> These guys had their spring training literally just abruptly yeah. and cut in half. And then they had to sit around till June. There is no way you could call that a fraud world series. Same what? with the guys in the bubble. Yeah, that had to like (laughs) instead of saying that's one of the easiest, that's one of the toughest. Yeah, rings to be won. So no, you won't. The biggest thing with the Clippers and and their complete failure in the playoffs was that those guys didn't want to stay in that bubble much longer. They 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 wanted to get out the bubble more than they wanted the championship. Yeah. Well, you saw the guys' faces. You saw it on the emotion of all the guys once they got reunited with their families and they were on the planes. Uh, You saw the picture of Dame and his son once the Blazers were eliminated by the Lakers. Like. These guys couldn't wait to get out of there. They couldn't see their family. It was just yeah. horrible. Yeah. Um, so, but the only thing I gave the bubble, um, and they fixed it in the baseball playoffs, actually, to, to make a point about that is no crowds. And I, I am a firm believer in a little bit of home court advantage, the energy you could take and feed off the crowd. Uh, momentum is real, contrary to what all the uh, youngins want to say out of there. You yeah. know, shout out Theo Ash. I can't believe he said that. I, nah. can't believe that. <laughs> I, I unfollowed the second I heard it. Speaking about <laughs> speaking about momentum, this guy has great momentum, especially in the wide open field when he's running. And this <laughs> we're gonna switch sports a little bit. We're gonna go to your favorite team, the New York Giants. We're gonna stay in New York, but go to a different sport. And uh, Daniel Jones, um, like I said, uh, he has great momentum, especially running. Yeah, he can. He could carry that momentum forward with him. So if Daniel Jones has, you know, continues to struggle this year or struggles again this year, how long until they pull the plug on him and bench him? Um, I think that there is two situations here. First of all, uh, the things, the thing to the two things most that Daniel Jones needs to improve on right away in order to succeed and not even have this be a conversation anymore is pocket awareness He cannot read the blind side whatsoever. And that is the cause of at least 75% of his issues. And then, yeah, obviously the turnovers. He's had, what, 29 turnovers in 26 games, something like that. Um, It's been atrocious. But I personally, as a fan, am giving him six games to show improvement. As a fan, before I'm just like, all right, get rid of this guy. I'm tired of it. Six games, period. But I think as an organization, they – Gettleman, this is Gettleman's guy, right? This is what Gettleman bargained a first round pick on a very high first round pick Mm -hmm. with, you know, I know a lot of people were calling for Haskins, but look how that worked out. So we dodged a bullet (laughs) with Haskins in my opinion. Um, But I just think, you know, they're going to stick with him through the end of the season. I I see the giants doing that. I see them giving him a full season under Joe judge and Jason Garrett. I think they're giving him the benefit of the doubt with, you know, the, the, no off season last year because of COVID and the second season under a new regime, finally some constant and some con- continuity with the New York giants organization and their coaching staff. So I think that where that's where that's headed. Yeah. I mean, it's really intriguing to see what the giants are going to do at 11th overall. I don't think they're in play for a quarterback. And that kind of lets me know that they're probably going to give Daniel Jones another season, like you're saying. So I kind of yeah. agree with you're saying, but me personally, I'm bringing it down to four games, but it really, it just depends for me. It just depends on uh, what the problems are. If he comes out and he's showing improvements and it's really just, just an experience issue and he just needs more experience, yeah, let's give him some more games. But if he comes out and he's sloppy with the ball, I know he said 29 turnovers, uh, he's fumbled. They maybe not lost all of them, but in his first two seasons, he has fumbled 29 times. 
and thrown 22 interceptions. Now, you don't lose all the fumbles, so they don't all count as turnovers. But to me, if my quarterback or running back fumbles, I count it as a turnover even if we recover it because that's unexcusable, right? And it's just about stuff like you're saying, just awareness, who's around you. When do you got to tuck the ball and take a sack? When do you got to try and run out? He can move. The dude can move. When do you got to try and get out of the pocket and go? Yeah, if he still has those turnover problems, that's where I'm like, cut it. Because in the NFL, if you have turnover problems, it doesn't matter if you're Aaron Rodgers. You're not going to succeed, and your team's not going to win. And the Giants right now are building a sneaky good roster that could compete Dude, for that division. They are set up. This is the best – let's put it this yeah. – this is the best offense Daniel Jones has had, hands down. He's got a number one weapon now with Galladay. He's got a pretty damn good second weapon and third weapon and fourth weapon mm-hmm. in Shepard, Ingram, and Slayton. Saquon coming and back. And even Kyle Rudolph there. And he's hopefully, knock on wood, going to have a 100% Saquon Barkley. Yeah. So let's – Gettleman, Joe Judge, the, the front office, they have done their diligence. They have set – this man up to succeed and they've set the new york giants up to succeed on both sides of the ball so now yeah. it's put up or shut up time yeah and it's, it's pretty bad for my los angeles chargers who also need a tackle desperately at 13th overall but i think that they can even improve that offense a little bit more with rashawn slater at 11th or if slater goes man i'm in on derisaw also i think derisaw is a beast so either one of those guys the giants would even help saquon and danny dimes even a little bit more and i want to point out the New York Giants defense is very underrated also. This might be the best yeah. defense Danny Dimes has ever seen. This is the best team he's ever played on. So oh, if he lead, I think it's time to yank it and go ahead and try and find someone because the NFC East, in my opinion, is the most wide open division. And whichever team, if the Cowboys can get a defense, they're going to take it. If Washington can find a quarterback, they're going to take it. If New York can figure out their woes and turnover problems, they're going to take it. I feel like all three of those teams – all right, a breaking point right here. And one of them is going to have to take over for the next couple of years. <laughs> Philadelphia is just a dumpster fire. I got to add that oh, in there. They got, yeah, they got, too much, gambles. they got too much work to do. They're, they're, Mike just wants to see Mike Glennon in there. And let me tell you, I think uh, Daniel Jones stays the whole 16 games. I've been on record and I'll say it again right now so people know. I think the Giants are the best team right now in that division. Uh, the Eagles are the worst team in the NFL. I think they finished dead last. I think that what the Giants have built, and remember, the Giants did beat that team from Washington two times last year, beat them twice. So uh, you can say what you want about Washington, but I think the Giants are the best team. I think Daniel Jones will get it corrected. You got Jason Garrett working with them. Uh, you got the, Joe Judge is something different. And like you said, that defense alone is looking good. Um, but I don't think Daniel Jones can spinch at all unless he's hurt or. Uh, I mean, I can't say at all because if he does come out and he's like horrible, 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 okay, bench him. But I think they're going to let him work through his mistakes again and get there, and you don't, you don't need 10 wins to win that division. It's already been proven. So, um, I mean, if you're happy with 8-8-1 eight, eight, and one or 8-8-9 eight, eight, and nine and win that division or 8-9 and nine and win that division, I think Daniel Jones is your guy. It's a good take. Oh, well, I will also got I, – I got to say this. There's reports that Daniel Jones has gotten his receivers – and his guys together down in Arizona uh, for workouts, you know, workouts before the season, getting his guys together, getting in sync, getting in a little groove. That includes Kenny Galladay, Sterling Shepard, Darius Slayton, Ingram, Rudolph. They're all down there together. And that's, that's good to hear. No one's done that since who? Eli Manning. So come back, Eli. Eli, come back. <laughs> I never thought I, you know what? No. Not the last five seasons of Eli. Eli, <laughs> Eli before that, sure. The yeah, miracle Eli. Should have kept Geno Smith, huh? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll never forget. I don't think I'll ever forgive Ben McAdoo for benching Eli Manning for Geno Smith. One game and then went back to him. Like, you ruined his whole streak, everything. Just for that one. Oh, my God. It was horrible. Like, and they won. They, they did win. Yeah, it was heartbreaking. <laughs> I think. Oh. Wait, wasn't it against the Raiders, Joe? Yeah, it was. <laughs> Raiders. I actually think the Raiders won that game, to be honest. Surprised. Yeah, I remember, it was Geno Smith, and I, I do think the, the Raiders won. Um, so speaking about the Giants, your thoughts on Leonard Williams coming back. They gave him a lot of money. They signed Kenny Galladay. I think we'll, we'll get into Kenny Galladay in a minute. And the Adore Jackson signing. So they, they, they've been aggressive this offseason. What do you think about that? Um, one, well, 
first, I like the Leonard Williams signing. I do. I think Leonard Williams had them in a precarious position because he was going to... He was going to get a lot of money either way, and it, whether it was from the Giants or not. And I think if he plays like he did last year, man, he, he's worth that paycheck. He had, what do you have, 12 and a half, 13 sacks last year? Yep. I mean, it, he was a beast. And not only that, he was a very, very big part of their run game. To, I mean, the run-stopping game, too. So I, I love what Leonard Williams has been bringing. Now, as far as the Dory Jackson – that's a little ridiculous to me. $13 million a year average um, for a guy coming off a pretty, you know, significant injury. And, you know, the same, the same can be said about Kenny Galladay, but I'm a little more optimistic about Kenny Galladay than I am about Adore Jackson. Uh, I think the more lateral movement of the position of quarterback for Adore Jackson is going to be tough. I believe it is a knee injury with Adore Jackson, correct? Mm, mm, which is not good for cornerbacks. <laughs> no, the lateral movement and the backwards movement. I mean, I'm going to have to see what I could see. I guess, you know, see what the reports are coming out of training camps and see what they are coming out of preseason games and watch the footage. Cause that's a lot of money to invest in a, into an unknown. Now, as far as Galladay, I love that signing. And I was like a little psychopath on Twitter when he was meeting there for three days, just every 10 seconds refreshing my Twitter waiting for the Galladay news. Yeah. Because I was excited. I, it, 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 it's a much-needed weapon, a weapon they haven't had since Blacksico. Yeah, and he's a guy that can go up and get the ball. I think they overpaid a little bit on him, but it's not that big a deal when you look at uh, the wide receiver. He was probably the best wide receiver available in free agency, so you kind of expect to pay like a couple mil above what's expected just because, you know, they're – Kenny Galladay's agent is expecting inflation and stuff, so, you know, they're going to pay like a couple more million dollars just expecting that cap to keep going up in the future. So I'm not too upset about it. And like I said, they needed a wide receiver one, a clear wide receiver one. And now you got the wide receiver one and the best group of wide receiver twos. <laughs> I mean, just all wide receiver twos, Slayton, Shepard, all those guys, wide receiver twos. And, and, and I like them as wide receiver twos in that offense. As far as Leonard Williams, to go back to him, I think he's one of the most, if not the most underrated defensive lineman in the league right now. No one talks about Leonard Williams, but he silently he gets to work down there in the trenches. And I think that was a good sign for the Giants to keep him around. And like you said, he was going to get signed. You pay, you got to pay to get that kind of production. That's how I yeah. felt with Joey Bosa when the Chargers gave him the max record breaking deal. Like, well, we got to pay to keep him, obviously. I mean, he's going to go somewhere else and make the max money. It's not like we're going to yeah. get a discount for somebody. Somebody's going to pay them that money. That's the thing. If it's yeah, not yeah. the Giants, it'll be somebody else. Yeah, you're not going to find a discounted player that's going to give you Joey Bosa or Leonard Williams production. Adoree, I had the same concerns. Because even before the uh, injury, I don't look at him as a true cornerback one. $13 million a year, that is a true cornerback one paycheck. And if he was the true cornerback one of the Titans – they were one of the worst secondaries in football over the last couple of years. So that's not good news. You don't want to be the quarterback one of that team anyways. So we'll see how it works out. And then knee injuries with cornerbacks is scary. Trust me, Jason yeah. Verrett. Yeah, Leonard Jason Williams, Verrett. great signing. Great signing. You had to do it. There was a little talk early in the offseason that they were like, maybe they won't come to a deal because Williams is asking for so much money. Once I saw his contract, I was like, what were they crying about? That was a good contract. I thought that was good. Um, Kenny Galladay, on the other hand, the, I don't have a problem with Kenny Galladay himself going into the office. I think it's a great fit. I do have a, con a problem with that contract because mm -hmm. you look at what all the other wide receivers got. He got what five million more than my guy Nelson Aguilar. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think they bid against himself. I don't know if they had to, but I wonder how many teams were actually going for Kenny Galladay this offseason. Like, legitly. Like, I know once they figured the price was a little bit dropping, but I think he played the Giants uh, enough. And I got to I gotta question his heart a little bit because I'm one of those guys that think he set out last year with a injury that wasn't an injury, if you can see my hands. It's um, because he was out there saying it was his hips, but then there was pictures of him grinding and doing all this stuff. So – was it just that he didn't like Matt Patricia and the Detroit Lions and he just set out the whole year? But it would have been better if he would have just said, hey, you know what? I'm opting out and let his teammates know instead of, you know, every week, oh, I might play this week. I might not. So I, I question his heart and, and where he's at. And maybe then maybe going to New York is a whole different thing and he's done. And the Adoree Jackson, pff, 
Get that on out of here. <laughs> you know what I bet happened? I, uh, I bet some guy that used to wear 81 for the Lions probably gave him a call and said, bro, just get to free agency. Just get to, yeah. get your behind to free agency. Yep. Well, here's here's my thing is according to a lot of the reports and what many have said within the organization, that's kind of why it took a little long is because the Giants brought this guy in, Joe Judge, Dave Gettleman, the Maras, they brought him into the stadium. They sat down and they really interviewed him because they, you know, strictly about what you just said, they had the same concerns. Joe Judge is a character guy. He's not going to bring guys in that are going to ruin what he's trying to build and the culture he's trying to build of winning smash mouth football. You can, you could just see that. Yeah. And I think they really sat down and got to the, down to the nitty gritty about that. And I think, I don't think Kenny Galladay was a giant if those concerns were still there. So I could see why they're there and I could see why people from the outside looking in would think that of course. Um, But I think Joe judge and the giants did their due diligence. Now, I will say this about Odori Jackson. I'm not optimistic. And yes, I think that was like one of the worst free agent signings of the offseason or all around the league. But I will say this. He does have a close relationship with Logan Ryan. And he doesn't need to be the number one guy because we have a man named James Bradbury who has solidified himself as the number one cornerback on that team. So I think there's a lot Odori can still learn because he's still very pretty young uh, as well. So I think... You know, after after the first eight games, we might we might just see how how uh, how he fits into the system because you got to remember they also have this guy Xavier McKinney that only played the last few games of last season. Their first, their second round pick out of Alabama, so he was legit in college. McKinney was, and I'm actually kind of excited yeah. to see what he becomes. And yeah, Dory could completely shut us all up if he just comes out and even plays just good. Because like you said, Bradbury and him, if he can just play good. And covered the second wide receiver. It's my, yeah. my only problem is is the money, man. He he made way more than a cornerback two would be making in the league right now. I mean, we got Mike Davis, who I look at as a solid cornerback two. I think for six and a half a year or something. Yeah. So and we doubled that for a Dory Jackson. <laughs> yeah, thing. I like a Dory. I'm rooting for him. I mean, I'm a USC guy, and I watched him in college growing up, and he's always been around this area. I love a Dory, um, and I'm rooting for him. I just I just think. Maybe they paid him too much. Maybe they could have gotten away with a one-year deal on him just to prove it here. Yeah, and I think that – see, so we're not we're not really saying much about the player. We're just saying the, the money aspects. Yeah. We, if the contract was a little bit, we would have been okay with it. We think they're good fits. Dory Jackson, uh, like you said, they already have two cornerbacks. They, this could be the third one. So they can move him around. I believe in Joe Judge. I think Joe Judge is building a great team of, over there. So that's what I have to – continue to think in my mind that Joe judge has this giants team on the right track. And if he thinks it's a good signing, it's a good signing. You know, it, you know, the beginning stages here of Joe judge and already the changes to the culture of the New York giants that everybody can see from the outside. It kind of reminds me of the first couple seasons of the Tom Coughlin regime. You know, he, he went in there. He wasn't exactly, they didn't think he was going to succeed. Um, he didn't exactly have a great track record with Jacksonville, even though he brought them to the playoffs as an expansion franchise. Um, but I think that it, the similarities are there. He's going in there. He was questioned a little bit. Everybody was like, ha, huh, who is this joker? But he's gained that locker room and he's gained the, the team's respect. He even went toe to toe with his offensive line coach said, listen, man, I'll kick your ass and then fired him. You know, like, that's great. Like, he is he's ready to go to war for his guys, and I think that's going to go a long way with, with a young Giants team. Yeah, I remember when that report came out. That was, that was pretty insane. And the thing <laughs> is, like, being on football teams my whole life and being around, like, what happens at practices and how all these ego-driven dudes are all together from the coaches and the players. Like, I could see yeah. it happening. I could see it happening. So I, I think that would be a pretty cool story to share. Uh, if you're that offensive line coach, anyone on the team, or if you're Joe Judge for the rest of your life, like yeah, we just we decided we're gonna settle our differences. We're just gonna we're just gonna drop the gloves and let's go. <laughs> I love that. I think that's great, and like that just goes to show you warrior mentality, and I think that's awesome, and that's what the Giants have been lacking. The Giants have been lacking 
Pat Shermer and Ben McAdoo were not hard nosed guys. They were finesse, look good, you know, little pitsy patsy coaches. And that's not what the New York Giants are about. They never, you know, that they've never been that kind of franchise. And I think we're finally back on the right track with Joe Judge. I agree. Yeah, I, li- I like what the Giants are doing. I already said I'm already on record of saying that they're the best team in the division at this point. So, I mean, you got some I good like things going that. for you. <laughs> hey, I mean, it's not really – I don't know if it's a good thing because the division's not that great. But... Hey, dude, listen, somebody's got to be the best at being bad, man. Come on. As long as it's not the Cowboys. As long as it's not <laughs> them boys. That's all I got to say about that. But, you know – um, yeah, I like I like what's going on in New York. They're, they're they're moving in the right directions, like we said. Uh Joe Judge is doing his thing. But uh yeah, um I don't know I don't know what else to say about the Giants because everything that they do, everything that they're touching is 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 turning out to be good. Uh what were they six and ten last year without Barkley? He's coming back. If they could just get Barkley for a little bit, like if he, I mean we all hope that he stays healthy the whole season. But if he could just be on the field, imagine how great this team is going to be with him because he'll take so much off of Daniel Jones's shoulders. Exactly, man. And the thing with Saquon is you just got to get him in a little bit of space so he could be a big part of the you know play action pass game too. I mean, we already know who he's going to be. We've seen what he could do out in space and healthy. It's phenomenal. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like Barry Sanders stuff. Yeah, we've, you know, we've seen it in the league, man. When we have a really good run game with an elite running back like Saquon can be when he's healthy, it helps out that play action game a ton. And that's why, uh, you know, we did the mock draft today. Brian took a receiver to the Titans, took Rondell Moore, that really speedy receiver. That's why I love it. You want those little speedy guys because when you go on the play action after handing off to Derrick Henry 25 times in the game, the corners are impressed one on one coverage because everyone's coming up to stop the run. Yeah. Playing that thing. Danny Dimes is going to be the make or break for this particular season, but I like where the Giants are going. And whenever they figure out whether it's going to be Daniel Jones or someone else at that quarterback position, they're going to be really, really, really good. Daniel Jones needs to get his football game on the level of Joe Morley's transition game between topics. Yeah. Yeah. What I for said. Sure. Elite. This episode has been your best episode, Joe. <laughs> hey hey don't forget who your guest is oh that's why i think that's right uh, <laughs> look, at, look at that well uh, listen i will say this about saquon though like um i think he's also going in and i know a lot of people are gonna maybe think this is a hot take but this giants offensive line is young i think i know they didn't do a lot to quote unquote improve on it and but i do think that they have a chance on growing on the little bit of success they did have towards the end of the season last year. I think they were getting a little bit better. They were getting used to playing with each other. And I do think they are going to take a lineman at 11 as they should. If Slater's there, you take him. Um, and I'm looking for Andrew Thomas to not be a bust. <laughs> Can we not let Andrew Thomas be the next <laughs> Eric Flowers, please? For the love of God. Get it together. I cannot go through another Eric Flowers. <laughs> I don't know why you're knocking Eric Flowers, but <laughs> what? Because when he was on the Giants, he was hands down like <laughs> the worst offensive lineman in football. It wasn't even close. Uh, <laughs> I'm just giving you, know you a hard time. Giants, Giants, don't worry about offensive line, guys. I know Joe Joe <laughs> and everyone in the Giants organization watches the show. You guys need another receiver or corner no you don't need know with the linemen just leave the offensive lineman alone actually everyone in the first 12 picks should follow that lesson because there's no good offensive lineman in this draft just at 13 we can start drafting drafting a lineman i will say this i do think that there is a chance that they go with micah parsons if he's there at, at 11 i like that one uh, why not I, well joe why judge not? was at his pro day he interviewed him at his pro day sat down with him was really intrigued, really interested. I just think there's a chance. There's a chance. I know there's one team that really wants Parsons, but they're at number 17 and they want to move on up. <laughs> <clears throat> but I did a mock draft. I did a mock draft a couple of days ago getting ready for this uh Warzone Sports Network mock draft, which is up right now. If you guys want to go check it out, we did it on Sunday. But uh yeah, I did a mock draft and Sewell went to the Bengals at five, and then Slater went to the Panthers 
at eight, and then the Giants took Derisaw. So here I am sitting here drafting for the Chargers. Like, how did three offensive tackles go in the first 13 picks? Please, NFL GMs don't make it. See, we we like you just mentioned, we just did we did our mock draft on the Warzone Sports Network. It was our first edition, but a lot of people were surprised of how many offensive and I, especially me because I had a couple teams and I I think I want to say I took two of the offensive tackles, but a lot of the offensive linemen went in our first mock draft, and people were surprised with that. But you shouldn't be because the good thing for the Giants in this draft is that it's loaded with offensive linemen. Offensive linemen and wide receivers are loaded in this draft, and that's a good thing for the Giants. And if they can – so say they don't get them at the top pick, their first pick. Say Parsons does fall to them, and that's where they want to go. I have faith that they can get a good offensive lineman somewhere else in the later rounds that are that's going to make a difference. I'm glad you bring that up, Joe, because I was watching a little bit of the live stream of the Warzone Sports Network mock draft. And Joe Morley, I'm here on record right now. Joe Morley made the most underratedly good pick of the first round mock draft. And I hate to inflate his ego. But I was waiting the whole time for somebody to pick this guy. And Joe Morley did. And that's Mr. Little out of Stanford. That was a great pick, man. Great pick. Thank you. After that draft... Uh, off the air. And Mike, I'm so sorry that <laughs> you're gonna have to deal with that. But dude, it was a dub for Joe Morley, man. After that, know. after the draft, we were off air. Mike <laughs> told me that was the worst pick. That was. The I worst think pick. he actually made fun of me in. The Did co- he really? I loved Mike. it. I said underrated pick. By the way, Mike put, "Oh, Joe Morley took a second to third round tackle for his own team at number 17 overall." <laughs> That's exactly what you did. That's exactly what you did. There was like three offensive tackles that are going to go before Little. You could have gotten him in the second round. I don't know. A two-round mock draft because I want to know who you're going to take in the second round, a seventh rounder? So, so Nick, <laughs> all the same. Well, no, I same just – this guy's stock has been climbing in the recent days. It has. But there's been a lot more talk about him around the league. I just read a feature article about him today. But um, the 18th, I'm telling what? you. But the 18th. It, it's it's looking like he could move up into the later part of the first round. I hope, the Raiders, do it. I hope the Raiders do it. I don't want them to get any other awesome people that they could get at 18. So, yeah, get the tackle out of Stanford. <laughs> Quiddy yeah. Pay. He went all the way. He didn't get drafted in the first round. Quiddy Pay. And I'm a part of that. I had some of those late round picks. It is, it, oh, it, you know what? Quinny Pay is probably going to go before Little, obviously. <laughs> Thank it's you. a mock draft. It's fun. We had fun with it. Oh. I wanted to get Little. But in it there. was an underrated pick. It was. It's like yeah. one of those names that what wasn't jump out at you, but when you said that, I was like, "Oh shit!" I was just reading about that guy today. I think he. I think maybe I did draft him a little too high, but I just wanted to get it out there, let people know. Let, let like you said, people are going to realize that name, and they're going to know that I. I said it. I was. I've been on the, the Walker little train, and I and like I told Mike, I go maybe he won't go there, but I think he goes first round. If it happens now, then I'm never going to hear the end of it. So I just hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> just hope well, if he does go first round, it's going to be at the very end. It's going to say be- he's there at, you know, first, let's say either the, for the Chiefs or the Bucks or the Packers or somebody like that. Why wouldn't they? I you think, know, I think I'm still going Landon Dickerson or I'm going Samuel Cosme over him. Yeah, but that's the thing about the NFL draft is people fall in love with their one player. Last year, there was four offensive tackles that went, what, the top 15 picks? The Giants supposedly took the one that was all pro, ready to go from day one. He ended up being the, the one that needed the most work, right? The other three outshined him. So it's going to be the same thing here. I'm not saying Penny Swell is going to be. Thanks for bringing that up, Joe. Appreciate it. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, you, you saw it. You saw it firsthand being a Giant fan that, just because they say a prospect is day one ready doesn't mean that he is. I did take Aziz over Phillips and Quiddy Pay, so I feel like I could get the same heat. So I'm gonna I'm gonna back off a little bit, Joe. I'm gonna back off. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were just having fun, but I, I I just thought that I should let it be known that I was I was there. I was feeling it. Wavelength, same wavelength, Joe. Same wavelength. Same wavelength. I'm just, I'm just glad it was to the Raiders. That's all. Mike, I- 
Listen, guys, we're going to be doing a lot of work together. I'll have those moments with you too, Mike. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You don't want those moments. You don't want those moments with Mike. Yeah. Right, come on <laughs> you have those moments with Mike, you know you're wrong. I'm going to come on here with my Cleaver jersey, and I'm really going to piss you off. <laughs> oh, my God. Do you actually have a Maxi Cleaver jersey? No. <laughs> why, why would I? Why would I? <laughs> All right. <laughs> he stopped everything. He said, wait. Hey, I just no. stopped him right there. No, oh, 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 oh. we got to talk about our him. partnership here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's actually he's actually the bum is hurt right now. So oh okay. So good for you, I guess. <laughs> no, they just lost to the Spurs tonight, man. Killed me. Yeah. Ah. Uh, hey, I have one thing before we go. And you you know, uh we're talking to Nick Mac Daddy. He's gonna be doing uh inside the crosshairs, right? I said that right? Into the crosshairs. Into, into the crosshairs. Into the crosshairs. Sorry, I'm still getting the name down. Um yeah. the basketball show. Hey Nick. I took I took the Phoenix Suns to go to the NBA Finals early before the season. Mike said I was um, not smart. He called me all kinds of names. Uh, what, do you, what do you think? What do you think? I mean, dude, you made that pick before the season. He did. That that is absolutely incredible. Like I knew I knew they were going to be a improved team. I saw them as like a five seed max. I didn't see them as the second best team in the West. And that is just the Chris Paul effect, man. Mm -hmm. And we'll see how far that can take them in the playoffs. I'd love to see it. Chris Paul doesn't exactly have the greatest playoff track record. So I'm hoping that the youth of Devin Booker and DeAndre Ayton and Mikhail Bridges will help carry them on. I think it, I think they can for sure. I think the team to watch in the West and I think a lot more people realize it now, and it's not fun to call them the dark horse anymore, so that really sucks. Is the Well, yeah, Mike, obviously the Lakers, but <laughs> no. But what I'm saying is uh, the Denver Nuggets. And they are – they just lost to the Celtics today. They got blown out by the Boston Celtics, by the way. Um, but uh, uh, prior to today, they were – they are now 9-1 and one since the Aaron Gordon trade. And Aaron Gordon may not be making his – his presence known on the stat sheet. He's not putting up phenomenal numbers, but watch Nuggets game, man, the chemistry and how they move in sync on both ends of the floor. Jokic and Gordon and Michael Porter Jr. are really working well off of each other. And they're going to be a scary team in the playoffs. Um, but Joe Morley, the Phoenix Suns, man, preseason prediction. Props. Props, I'm dude. sorry I mean, to give you more love. Here. I, mean, I feel like I'm outnumbering <laughs> of for our good friend Mike here, but Jesus, Joe. No, 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 no. I'll like, give him that one because like that dude, is we all we all saw the potential in that. Play, yeah, like, that little bubble thing they did there. They went eight and zero, right? They, they looked, they showed promise. Like you said, I thought they were going to improve. Seventh, yeah. eighth seed, sixth seed, fifth seed. Okay. Yeah. This man came out and said they're going to be one of the best teams in the Western Conference and be in contention for the finals. And sure enough, everything has been falling in line for the Suns to raise up in the Western Conference standards. Joe, is that the hottest take that you've given that has come true? Probably. Probably. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> Nick, you're welcome back on the show anytime. I'm telling you right now. When you, <laughs> you're building me up. Like, and Mike, I know Mike is just boiling inside right now like i mean next time we just got to bring up some of mike's victories that i just got to be yeah, here and be a tight man yeah. he oh, doesn't I'll have any guys, i will be i will gladly be the mick to your rocky all right all right there you go there you go <laughs> i'll take it this is uh nick mac daddy you guys can find him at mac daddy ryan show or mac daddy the ryan show on uh instagram and tiktok guys go look him up then watch him on the new show, uh, starting pretty soon on the Warzone Sports Network. Of in, uh, I'm probably gonna mess it up, but into the crosshairs, All right? Got it? Did I get it? Yes, you got it. You got it finally. You can get it. <laughs> pump me up one more time, Mac. Pump me up. You one all more these things I'm pumping you up for. You're kind of losing it with the name of the show here. Come yeah, on, <laughs> you keep I, the Phoenix Suns pick right. Probably the hottest take I've ever seen come true in my life. But you can't say into it's the up there, man. It's up there for me. Too. <laughs> it's up there. <laughs> uh, but you're welcome back anytime. You were an awesome guest. Uh, I loved it, and I appreciate, I appreciate you, you coming fellas. on, Mike. Uh, I appreciate you, fellas. Thank you so much. I can't wait to be a part of the Warzone Sports Network. Maybe you guys can finally help me get my followers up on TikTok. Jesus, <laughs> go follow me. 
Damn. <laughs> I follow you. I just want everyone to know I follow him. I follow yeah, Mike you. on the mic follows me. The supposed <laughs> goat of sports TikTok. Come on. <laughs> oh, that's probably why you're not getting followed. Oh, shit. <laughs> wow. Bro, he's calling out the Mike on the mic universe again. I always call them out. I always yeah. call those TikTok guys out. They're fake. I'm, I'm just gonna get off the mic. <laughs> Mike, Mike off, no, off no. the mic. Mike off the mic does not have a good ring to it. No. That will be my heel turn. Mike off the mic. And like at the end of each episode, I just like I'm I'm done with this. I just start unplugging shit. That that's your <laughs> that's your Eric Bischoff move. Yeah, I'm gonna do a heel turn. Mike off the mic. All right. It's not gonna work for you. <laughs> All right, Mikey. Now. Mike Heyman. Let's go. Thanks for coming on, Mike. See you on Friday night. My hot take is going to be Danny Dimes for MVP next year. Watch it come true. See, I said it after the show ended, so that way I can select whether it gets out to the public or not.